Hi, I'm Peggy Farron, and we are live with the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. Welcome to ep episode 110. Our guest today is travel and landscape photographer Ted Davis, so he's going to share some tips. But first, if you're watching this live, please share it if, on your Facebook page. It really helps us get new uh, viewers and, and, and people to subscribe to the show. And uh, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. We have a free webinar. If you haven't seen it, if you just go onto our website, understandphotography.com, and click on any of the show notes. It's always, there's always a link in the show notes to a free webinar called How to Get a Solid Photography Education in Just Four Weeks. That is kind of like a little overview of what you need to learn if you're really trying to learn photography or if you think you might have gaping holes in your photography education. It'll give you kind of a blueprint on what you need to learn. And it'll also give you a little feel for my teaching style because I offer a class. Of course I offer a class, right? That, that covers all of that. It's called the Four Weeks to Proficiency in Photography. And it's an, it's an online class, but it's also interactive. So I'm right there with you while you're taking the class. You have to turn in your homework to me. So you're going to get a lot of attention, a lot of feedback. And the next one starts November 13th. We had one start this week, so the next one will start November 13th. Again, understandphotography.com. Um, we sold out of our Everglades trips for January 24th and January 31st, so we scheduled another one for February 7th through 10th. Now, Joe Fitzpatrick has been leading that Everglades trip for many years. You know, we live right here. We live in the Everglades, so we know the area. So it's a fabulous trip. If you're interested, I think there are three openings left, but I know they're going to go fast because those other two sold out this week. Okay, so my guest today is travel and nature photographer Ted Davis. Ted has his images shown in exhibits in New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Tokyo, London. He's a big shot. Anyway, he also teaches immersive photo and cultural workshops in amazing locations around the world. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. And you live in St. Pete, right? St. Pete now, yeah. St. Pete, but you lived all over, it sounds like. Moved all over. Uh -huh. I was uh, born and raised in New York, lived in Maine, D.C., uh, North Carolina, Virginia, Florida. So, yeah, been all up and down the East Coast. Florida's the best, though, right? I love Florida. <laughs> I, love, I love Florida. So, now, tell me the brief background. So, how did you brief get into photography? Background. I've always been in photography. Um, okay. I started with my dad's Nikon F way back when, film in high school, in the dark room. Um, you know, a favorite photographer growing up was Ansel Adams, just like many people. And um, it kind of fell by the wayside when I went through college and I actually went to law school. Um, went and I uh, graduated from law school in uh, D.C. in 2011, went up to New York City, um, worked as a lawyer in New York for a couple wow. of years. Um, and that's where I kind of rediscovered photography. Wow. Uh, started shooting around in the city. Work would send me on trips. Um, you know, we were a, a big firm, and so we'd go all over. And I'd bring my camera with me. So I'd, I'd you know, we'd go to Chicago, and I'd take a flight on a weekend from Chicago to, you know, Zion National Park or Bryce, or I'd go to the Grand Canyon, or I'd go to Yosemite or Yellowstone, and uh, rediscovered it. Quit my job after a few years, started doing this full time, and have not looked back. Wow. Yeah. That's an amazing story. <laughs> and you're young, too. Yep, 32. So wow. uh, still a little bit of road ahead of me. That but. is amazing. Mm -hmm. And so you're making a full-time living now yes. as a photographer, mm -hmm. as a fine art photographer, selling your artwork. As a fine art photographer, and I do workshops and as well. And workshops. Yep, I don't do too many in the States. Like, I know you guys do the Ever Everglades one. That's really fascinating. Yeah. Um, love some of the images coming from there. Yeah. Uh, I do most of mine abroad. So okay. Italy, Iceland, um, Africa. Actually, wow. my next trip is Iceland. Um, wow. we're, yep, we're photographing the ice caves and the northern lights for five nights. Five days and five nights. Um, and do you have openings for that? Nope. We no, are sold, sold out. out. Yep. So. Maximum of six people. Um, I cap it at five. If it gets there, I got five people. So we're going with five. And we're going to end of November, early December. Wow. Yep. It's going to be cold. It will be cold. Five hours of daylight. It's going to be cold. It's going to be windy. That's the one thing in Iceland. Cold oh. is bad, but the wind, it just bites you right in here. So, so do you help like your people who are coming? Do you give them ideas on what to wear. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, yeah I've already sent them the list, uh, where to buy it, how to buy, what to buy. 
Um, yeah, I wear three pairs of socks, two pairs, three pairs of mittens. Uh, we're all about layers, on, like long johns, right up through your Under Armour, um, your jackets. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's cold, armor. but <laughs> there's a thing that you don't hear when you live in Florida. Oh, under yeah. Armour. <laughs> My son and his wife, they were raised here in Naples, mm -hmm. Florida, and they went on their honeymoon to Iceland because it was so different from oh, what, yeah, you know, when you live in Florida all your life. But, uh, ooh, it was cold for them. Yeah. Oh, I can bet, yeah. <laughs> I think when you've lived in Florida all your life, you don't really have a concept of how cold it can get. <laughs> and it can get cold. Yeah, I mean, we're photographing icebergs and glaciers there, so, yeah, it's... Uh, but if you're dressed for it... Yep, and, it and the thing is, you're so excited about being there, and you're so happy, and you're so busy, you know, trying to get your shot, you forget about the cold. Wow. And so it only really gets cold when all of a sudden you're waiting for the northern lights in oh, the dark. Yeah with the mountains around you and then we just kind of talk and we kind of talk about shots and composition and just kind of keep people energized um, keep them warm their, their thoughts off the cold it's really hard to shoot alone but when you have a group it's easier oh yeah that makes sense yeah because you're not just lonely and freezing yeah, <laughs> yeah i've been there so you've been there that's <laughs> right so how much research do you do? Like, let's let's just take this Iceland trip. Mm -hmm. Is this your first trip to Iceland? No, this will be my seventh. Okay, let's overall. pretend it's mm -hmm. your first trip that you're okay. bringing customers. Okay, so so I do would, you first go to Iceland and check out where you're going to yeah, go? Yeah. So if I never brought anyone, for instance, and I said, you know what, I want to start a workshop in in Iceland in the winter, uh -huh. I would have to go at least once myself. Okay. And when I did it, kind of the prep work I would look at, as I look at photographers I really liked, and see if they have gone to Iceland. Okay. Um, I see how they shot, what they shot, when they were there. Um, and then I look at local photographers. I try to find local Icelandic, for instance, photographers who shoot there and see when they shoot, how they shoot. Um, and then I'd use actually Google Maps of all things. I would Google map it out, um, see where things were. I'd check on weather conditions because you know, okay, Iceland winter, blizzards, snowstorms, ice. Am I even gonna be able to get to locations I oh. see these people are at? Or, oh. or did they have four by fours and I just won't be able to get there? Um, and sometimes there are locations where you, you just you can't access this unless you have a local guide. Um, and so basically, I kind of chase down and I start. And actually, my friends make fun of me. I, I handwrite out everything, and so I'll, I'll have list pages in my notebook of locations where they are, GPS locations, um, how far from what cities. Um, you and know, they're all written down. They're all I'll written down. So you can't then, just click on them. <laughs> no, no, you can't just click on them. And then I'll go and I'll circle, I'll star them, I'll cross them out if they're possible to do in it. And then I'll go myself and okay. I'll try to do it. And um, one of the things I found, the hardest thing I found is timing um, between locations is, it, it takes you a lot longer to go from one location, to shoot it, to wrap it up, and then go to the next because you're always trying to make sure you don't miss a shot. Oh, so right. I always end up spending an extra half an hour, 40 minutes at a location. And if you try to hit two or three spots in a day, next thing you know, you're, you're supposed to be at your sunset shoot and you're two hours away. And especially when you're, then when you bring people, it's even slower, right? Exactly. Yeah. So I really have to be able to go there myself and plan it out and kind of do a dry run before I bring anyone. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. So what are some of the things that you know, other people, like what other things are there involved in planning a trip? Like so, what, where else do you look? Do you look, like for me, I look on Pinterest. <laughs> so you know, I don't Pinterest look on Pinterest. Pinterest is kind of a girly thing, I, I know. I can't even figure out Pinterest. So, yeah, I don't know um, why, it's like 90% women on Pinterest. <laughs> But it's like I would go, well, my son, when he was talking about mm -hmm. going to Iceland, I did that. I said, Iceland pictures, and you see these amazing pictures. Yep. And you can do it on Google, too, mm -hmm. but. I don't really use Google a lot. I'll use Instagram. Um, but oh, Instagram's probably another scene. Now, that's my age showing yeah. that I, I, I'm not as into Instagram. Um, <laughs> but I, I think I showed kind of my proclivity. I like to handwrite things, so I actually go into books, and I go into magazines. Um, so I, I have 400 of Ansel Adams' favorite, famous photos, black and whites, a book of them. Oh, wow. Um, I actually bought in um, Yosemite when I was there last trip, and okay. I love flipping through that. Um, I love uh, looking through almanacs. Um, you know, I love picture books, you know, so. That's interesting. Um, finding so do you go to the library? Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I used to go to the library. I don't, can't remember the last time I've been in a library now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Now they're changing. They're they're more info centers than yeah, books. It they seems are. like. Mm -hmm. Now, do you hire a guide, like when you first get there, or sometimes hire a guide when you're there? I guess it depends on where you are, too. Yeah, sometimes. Um, but, you know, places. For instance, I have, I have a workshop in Africa. Um, I hire a guide and driver. Yeah, you almost um, have to in Africa, yeah, I think, right? Yeah, and you really want to because um, you know, for that, it's more you're you're, you're chasing wildlife. Um, you know, you are doing some landscape stuff, but you're, since you're chasing wildlife, the guides and locals really know time of year where the animals are. They can track them much better, see them much better. Um, you know, sometimes you'll pick out an animal that your guide won't see, but nine times out of ten, they're going to see it before anyone else. Yeah, and so yeah. you really want a great because they've guide. got that eye trained, and yep. they know what they know the signs yeah. and that kind of stuff. Um, places like Italy, where I go, I hire a driver, but then I know the itinerary, I know where to go, I know who we're meeting. Um, I now have friends there, and the, the, our driver actually, uh, he and I go back now about four or five years. So, yeah. uh, you know, we always meet up and we have a great time. And he, he knows me better than I know me sometimes. So, you know, hey, Ted, we got to go. And I was like, oh, yep, 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 you're right. You know, like, all right, guys, wrap it up and That's awesome. uh, we'll get going. Yeah, and um, he actually, he's had me at the house a few times now as well. So, yeah, it depends on the location and kind of what you need. And so I adapt depending on, on what I need. For us, we... Um like, well, for me personally, when I take it, like I went to Italy last year for my first time, mm -hmm. and when I was in Tuscany, I hired a guide. I mean, mm -hmm. that's a lot of farmland. How it do is. I know where to go? You know what I mean? I mean, they have some photo guides, but yeah. they weren't that good. No. Nope. So I just hired somebody to take me. And then next year, I'm going to the Czech Republic, and have you ever heard of the Moravian Fields? Mm-hmm. Oh, my uh -huh. God. Yeah. They look so amazing, but same thing. I'm looking for a guide because I yeah. don't know where to go. Mm -hmm. So, and then we hire a guide in Cuba. But we've had same thing. We've had the same guide, you know, for since tw 2013. You yeah. know, she's she's part of the family now, yeah, just exactly. like your guides, exactly. right? So, um, all right. So I'm whipping through all my questions <laughs> before I even look at them. <laughs> so, how long do you spend with each? Like when you get to one location, or does it depend on the location? Um, it, it sort of depends. I have a rule of thumb. It's three days. Okay. So if I'm trying to get one photograph, if it's a landscape, for uh -huh. instance, um, three days is what I set up. So if I'm in a location and there are two shots that I want within driving dis distance from each other, I'll get one hotel. I'll get it for six days, um, or one Airbnb or, or hostel whatever. or whatever it is. And I will spend my first full day between the two locations, scouting out, figuring everything out, driving during the day, and then I'll go to all the other locations that could possibly be a shot in that area, With that, uh -huh. driving all that day. Um, and I'll, I'll pick one of the spots for sunset. And basically that first day is my scouting trip. If I haven't been to the location before, I get to figure out all the spots I would love to shoot, and then the two shots I really want, what best time of day to go. Um, you know, I'll, I'll use some apps that I have on my phone, I'll use my maps and, and figure out what the situation with the lighting will be the best, and then I target that. So for instance, if one shot is a sunrise, the other shot is a sunset, mm -hmm. I'll spend all six of those sunrises, well now five, now five of them, trying to get that shot, and the five sunsets trying to get that shot. Okay. If I'm really lucky, I'll get the shots in the first day or two, and then that first day of scouting, I'll be able to go and spend the rest of my time getting all those other little shots that maybe I wouldn't have gotten if I was just focused on the two big ones and I didn't get them. So that first so, thing kind of fills out the rest of my trip in that area. So when you take the people though, and you want that sunrise shot, mm. do you take them to that same spot more than once? So for, um, for those shots, um, we, for those are the Iceland and the Italy trips and stuff like that, we do. We try to do every location twice. Okay. Same lighting twice. So they make sure that they get the yeah, really good it's a picture. Goal. I would love to do it three times, but I do realize you're you're you know this is kind of a once in a lifetime thing for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, especially with a photographic guide, you want to see as much as possible while trying to get the so it's a balance. Yeah. Um, so you know for the Italy ones, I uh, I always have an optional sunrise the last two mornings, and uh, we are we're going pretty hard and we're going a lot. So I typically had many people sleep in because um, we've gotten very lucky with oh, the weather the past few years. Oh, they just get tired. Years. They want to. Yeah, I say, you know what? I say, hey, we're not leaving till nine. So if you want to wake up at four thirty with me and we go, we go for a mile hike and we go and we do a couple of shots and then we come back. We get breakfast and we leave. You're welcome to. If not, sleep in, have breakfast at eight thirty, 
nine o'clock we leave. So um, oh, wow. I've, I've always had one person take me up on that, but typically it's only one or two. Okay, people need their rest after you. Yes, you're driving yeah. them. Working them too hard. Working them a little, <laughs> a little hard, yeah, but it's a lot of fun, yeah. Now, do you have a favorite app that you use to figure out where the sun is? And yeah, that kind of so stuff? actually, it's called the Photographer's Ephemeral. Okay. Um, TPE. I think it's four ninety nine or six ninety nine on the App Store. Yeah, app store okay, I think it's more times. like. I think it's more like eight or nine, ten dollars. It's not cheap for an app. Yeah, for an app. Um, I mean, but as apps go, I but, bought it five years ago. Yeah. I want to say like right after it came out. Um, and it is absolutely crucial. Um, ping your location, you'll see where the sun rises, the sun sets, where it is where you are, so you can make sure you're, you're reading it right. The moon rises, it tells you all your information you need to know. For a landscape photographer and for an actual architectural photographer where you're shooting in cities, it's fantastic because you'll see where the sun is, and if you're standing right where you want to shoot, you'll be able to see, okay, the buildings are here, 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 the sun is going to be between these two at the right time, I know I need to shoot at 11:42 to 11:48. That's when the sun's here. It's my perfect shot. Does it? It tells you about the shadows too, mm -hmm. right? Doesn't it tell you where the like if the building is going to be in shadow it or does. something? Yeah, That's it's really fantastic. cool. Mm -hmm. It's hard to use though. Yeah, it's difficult. It's got a learning curve. There's um, there there are many levels. Mm -hmm. I stay on the kind of the base level, which is really just you're looking at your sun, your moon, um, your sun's rise, sunset, and then they can get it gets really in depth. So yeah. if you are really highly technical and wanna, you know, you're trying to get one exact shot, you can use it for that. Or if you're just like, all right, sun's here, sun's there, we got it. That's that's how that's, I use yeah, it. Yeah, that's kind of me too. <laughs> I'm not a technical person at all. So now, when you're going, mm -hmm. are are you focusing mostly on landscape photography on your trips, or does it just depend on the trip? It depends on the trip. Um, yeah, I would say you know your Iceland, Italy trips. Uh, I do southern France and the Provence region as well. Oh, that's, um, those that's my dream. Yeah, I want to go in July. Early right? Early July. Yeah. Yeah. The lavender the first week, and you know the sunflowers the second week. Oh, I didn't know mm -hmm. that. The sunflowers. Yeah, I the, have. Um, the fields are right next to each other too. When I went, I went in August last year, and the, all the sunflowers looked dead. Yeah. But I guess they don't harvest the seeds <clears throat> until they're all the way dead looking or something. Yeah, that's until why they're they wilted. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what they look like in August. So mm. that wasn't very pretty. <laughs> but I do um, house swapping. Mm -hmm. So that's how I went to Italy for a month. I swapped okay. houses with somebody. Oh, fantastic! And I keep getting people who live near, you know, in Provence area, mm -hmm. and they're like, "Oh, you know." Come in July, not never July, never yeah. July. I'm like, I want to come in July. <laughs> no, they don't want me in July. <laughs> so, um, for your people, when you're, when you're, how much guidance do you give your, 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 what do you call them? Do you call them customers or participants? Yeah, yeah, participants typically. Okay. Um, so, uh, like, do you tell them, like, how do they know what to bring? What kind of lenses do you bring? What so kind yeah, of cameras? So I, I what give kind them of a tripod? packet when they sign up. Okay. Um, and then throughout, you know, say someone signs up four months in advance, that's, that's typical, actually six months to four months. Uh -huh. um, they'll start getting emails from me and packets, um, information, what to bring, what to wear, what to expect, what to practice, camera fundamentals, all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm actually going to see one of my clients in a, in a week and a half. He's coming with me to Iceland. He's in Gainesville. So I'm driving actually two and a half oh. hours up um, to see him, to work through his, for a couple hours, just work through his camera, make sure he's comfortable with it. Because um, in Iceland specifically, you really want to be comfortable with your camera. So I'm going to get all the settings set up for him, make sure he's comfortable, then have him shooting for a couple of weeks before we go to Iceland. Yeah. Um, so when we're there, the guidance is, it really depends on the individual. Some people I've had who um, are almost at the semi-professional level, very, very comfortable with their cameras, really just needed me to tell them the best places. They didn't have the, the time, the patience, or whatever to right. do the research themselves. Right. They didn't want to worry about it. Um, and so they just, they're just using me kind of as a transportation and guidance yeah. to where to shoot. And I have some people who came up and say, hey, this is my camera. It's on automatic. I've never taken it off. What should I do? Yeah. And those people, um, you know, I've had a couple of them on my trips. And by the end, we always have him shooting on full manual by the end. They understand it. They may lose a little bit if they don't keep up with it. 
but they know everything. They know the aperture, you know, they know their ISO, um, they know everything you're doing, they figure out the, pl uh, the planes, uh, you know, they, they've got it by the end. I like you. So. <laughs> I'm like, you need a shoot in manual, you need to learn, at least know how. Yeah, if you know if you how. You don't have to, but you need to know how. And if you know why things work, you can sw switch to aperture priority, and then you can just, you can run from there, so. I like, I like you. So what kind of lenses do I need for, for my landscape trip with you to Iceland? Not that I'm going, but. <laughs> super fast, super wide. Super fast, super wide. Yep. So when we're shooting, we're going to be in the ice caves. Okay. So when we're in the ice caves, we're really, they're, they're, they're shallow, but they're high. So we really need to be able to get super wide. So we're talking 1424s. Oh. We're talking um, even a fisheye if you want to get kind of wild, do an eight. Um, you know, pretty much as fast as we can. You know, a lot of uh, you know. A lot is it of dark in there? It is. Oh, and um, you said it's only five hours of light. Yeah, and so we're there. We're in there for four of them. <laughs> so we catch sunrise. Wow. We go right into the ice caves. We come out. We catch sunset, and then we focus on the northern lights. So it's wow. yeah, it's it's a lot of fun, but it's we're busy. We're going, um, so you don't have to worry about the cold. <laughs> there you go. Where are they going to go to the bathroom? Uh, so there is a little uh, food snack place that we leave from, okay. so we'll be able to get food, go to the bathroom before the ice cave, come back. I mean, that's where we, that's where we leave our vehicle, and we'll be able to get some food and snacks and go to the bathroom afterwards as well. Tell I'm an older woman. Yeah. I think about it. those <laughs> things are important to people, you know. <laughs> I mean, I can handle it going out in the Everglades where it's nice and hot. But yep. I can't imagine trying to do that in my no, uh, no, we, uh, when it's freezing out. Yeah. <laughs> So what about if you are in um, <coughs> Africa, what are you going to bring? For that, you want your super telephotos. Um, so we're, we're talking, um, I personally love the, the Tamron and the Sigma 150 to 600 they came out with. They both, I believe they both came out the second generation. And okay. those are fantastic lenses, um, especially for someone on a budget. Maybe they don't want to fork over 12,000 for a 600 prime. Um, the 150 to 600 has excellent image quality and it gives you that huge range. Um, you know, and then you, you, you it's want... It's about a thousand bucks, I think. Yeah, I think like, yeah, like 1,200-ish, somewhere around there, you can get a rebate for a thousand. Um, so really, especially if you're spending all that money to go to Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, yeah. where I go, Namibia, um, you want to make sure you have the right lens. Okay. And so you can rent it for $150 for, you know, 10 days, 14 days. Oh, that's pretty um, good. Or you can buy it. Yeah. And so I recommend renting it if, you, if you're going to do a lot of wildlife, especially if you're in Florida. You can do a lot of birding. The mm -hmm. 150 to 600 is perfect. Um, and then, you know, I always, I always tell people, you know, your, your carry around for Africa, it's going to be your 70 to 200, which typically yeah. is not. Huh. But for that, you know, that's one where on the off chance that an animal comes nice and close to you, you can take that 7200, turn it, and you can you can capture the face, the eyes, um, really get some expression. Now, do you do you have two cameras with you when you're doing wildlife, so you can just grab two different lenses, or do you change lenses? So I actually, when I'm with my clients, I don't have my camera out. Oh, because you're just helping them. Yeah, so actually I have them have their second lenses out, and then if they need a different camera or a different lens, they just hand me it. I boom, change it for them, and hand it back. That um, would be confusing if you're a Nikon doing a Canon or a Canon doing a Nikon, right? Because they go different ways. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, I, so what I do is I actually had Canon and Nikon on my last trip, and so I put the Nikon shooters in the back, the Canon in the front. Oh, so you wouldn't get them. confused yeah, when so you're I switching knew, lenses? I knew where my Canon and Nikons were, so I was, you know, I wasn't trying to, you know, go the wrong way half the time. The first time I ever was, you know, when I first started <laughs> teaching in 2009, and I had been a Canon person fr from film, you know, I never even, I didn't know anything about Nikons, and everything they do is exactly the opposite. <laughs> it's like, what are they, at war with each other or something? I can't believe they even twisted off the lens yeah. different, jeez. So is there anything, like, if I'm going to go on a photo trip and spend all this money, you know, for traveling, mm -hmm. for, for, to bring you, or, you know, to have you as the guide and everything like that, what is, like, What's the one piece of equipment that is just, you know, you have to have? Obviously, your camera and a lens. Right. Is there anything else? I mean, so if we're talking about a landscape trip, uh, Italy, Iceland, France, um, your tripod. Uh, absolutely. And, and you know, I've, I've told people tripod, a really great tripod head is crucial. 
Um, if you don't have a great head, you're going to get frustrated with your tripod. Yeah, you're not going to like it's your gonna tripod. It's going to start. Yeah, it, it'll sag. Um, it'll be hard to tighten. Um, you might not get a, a pan on it. Um, so it's frustrating. And then what I find people, because they're so frustrated with it, they don't want to use it. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of what we're shooting in landscapes, we're shooting at f11, 13, 16, because we're trying to get so many planes in. Um, that you, and then you're trying to shoot it handheld without your tripod. Um, ISO so low to remove noise. Next thing you know, we're shooting half second shots trying to do handheld, and it just doesn't work Not out. Happen. Um, yeah. and, but they're frustrated with their tripod, and I understand that. So I, I offer to bring extra tripods. People can rent them from me, tripod heads. Oh, um, you know, that's I've a good people, idea. Yeah, well, just because at this point I have you know right half a dozen. And they come, um, and they always come with bad tripod. People don't understand mm -hmm. the importance of the tripod. Yeah. So, and uh, so they don't want to spend, you know, they want to spend, they think $150 is a lot of money for a tripod, yeah. and that's, that's a cheap tripod, right? right? I found some, some BenQs. Um, that's a brand I've found, I've been successful with. I think of uh, the starter BenQ at the, at the professional level, I believe is about $300. Okay. Um, I can't remember the exact name, but that's the one I point my clients to. Very a quality light tripod with a very high quality head. Okay, you're gonna um, have to look that up. So, because Heather will. Heather will put that in the show notes. Okay, absolutely. So, yeah, because yeah, tripods are are really important. I have yeah. I have this amazing customer. She gave me a tripod as a present, and um, it's hard to use. Mm -hmm. And so, just like you said, I don't I don't. And it's a better tripod than the one I have. Yeah. But I don't like it because mm -hmm. I have I struggle with getting it. You know, the head is just oh, absolutely. it's it's hard to turn and whatever. So, and I keep thinking I just have to keep using it until I get used to it. Get you know. Comfortable, yeah. Well, sometimes it's just it's more the equipment than trying to get comfortable with it. Um, and I've had clients, you know, just as important as the, and you know, we say make sure you bring your good camera and good lens. But sometimes. I've had clients where the camera's been too big, um, especially if you have smaller wrists. Um, I find this with, with women, they, they have smaller wrists, smaller hands. Um, lots of times holding a camera all day, um, especially with a bigger lens on it, hurts. Um, I don't even have big wrists and it does hurt me as well. Yeah. And so at that, you know, you're almost better off not bringing, you know, the big D850, D800, um, you know, it, you know, whatever that big line, and it's maybe, maybe it's stepping down, um, you know, uh, to a second level. Uh, maybe it's trying out a mirrorless. But if you're out shooting, especially on a photo workshop, you want to be comfortable carrying the, the camera day after day after yeah, day. Yeah, that's a good point. And so sometimes I say, hey, it's actually better because you're not, you're gonna not want to put your camera up to your face to take the shot if it's heavy and it's hurting you. It's better to get a camera that's maybe a little lighter, maybe a mirrorless, maybe a step down, because then at least you're getting the shot instead that's, of not getting the shot. That's you know that's great advice. In fact, uh, um, some, one of our listeners from the podcast, because this is also a podcast, mm -hmm. uh, emailed me this week and said, "I've heard you say so many times on your show that you're tired of all the heavy equipment," <laughs> and he said it's time to switch. And so he gave me all this advice and on what he thought I should switch to, which mm -hmm. I don't know yet, so I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> Do you have a favorite mirrorless? So I actually just got the new Nikon Z7 mirrorless. Okay. Um, I, I mentioned today that I, I was doing a photo shoot yeah. um, before the show, and that's I used that for a little bit of it. I also brought the 850, um, you know, with me, just, just in case. I ended up using the 850 a little bit more, just because we were on a, ton of, a time crunch. And um, you're more familiar with it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but so far, I'm very impressed with the Z7. Oh, really? Yeah. And I, looking at the size difference, I almost, I almost feel guilty as a professional dropping down to the size because it's so much smaller, so much lighter, oh, so much yeah. more compact. But that's what, um, that's what everybody wants right, right now. And, but it is a powerful, powerful camera. Do you have it with you? I do. It's in the car. Oh, after the show, I want to see it. Because <laughs> <All right. laughs> I've been hearing about it. I haven't seen yeah, one, though. Yeah. That is awesome. Now, do you bracket your images when you're taking landscape photography just to get different exposures? or? So I won't bracket for HDR. Um, 
I will actually do bracketing, and it's not really bracketing, it's more panos. Okay. So I'll do panos. Um, a lot of my clients, when I sell direct, uh, prefer the one by three, the two by one formats. Okay. So you're longer um, horizontals. And so I will, you know, put Just two so or three together um, cool. to make sure I get all the, the pixels and everything in there. Um, and then it's a little bit of work, you know, trying to, trying to get the, all the images to match up um, in Photoshop. Um, but for bracketing, I only will ever do it when there's such a disparity in lighting conditions. That well, I would really imagine a cave it would be. The ice cave is one of the only spots where I'll do a five bracket, and I'll typically pull out the second and the fourth. So I'll do the, the highest, the actual um, exposure, and then the lowest exposure. Okay, so now for the <coughs> people who don't understand what bracketing is, say that whole thing again so that they can understand it. Sure, so bracketing is essentially um, your correct exposure and then you're going a certain number of stops above and below it. So you're going with your correct exposure and then a plus one, a plus two, a negative one and a negative two. So you get all the dynamic range of all the light and all the color within five images. And then you take those five images and put them into the computer because we're using digital and we'll be able to get all the color, all the detail, and it's called an HDR image. Um, some high dyna dynamic range images are um, come off a little bit more contrasty. You just gotta minimize your contrast and it'll look very natural with getting all the detail there. Okay, yeah. It's funny because we used to bracket in the film days, mm -hmm. but there was no such thing as HDR back right. then, of course. But for us, you couldn't you couldn't immediately see if the picture was coming out. Right. Yeah. So we would take two or three or four shots yeah. with different exposures just to make sure you got a good one. You know, it was more of a oh, absolutely uh, more of a just just in case. <laughs> you know. So, do you have some memorable like what's your favorite excursion? Ooh, or what? Uh, or what's your favorite memory on a um, excursion? I, I'm not sure. I I think it was the first time ever seeing the Northern Lights. Really? Yeah. Um, I remember just, I was like a kid in the candy shop. Like, I just, I couldn't believe it. Um, and I was really lucky. We had a solar flare the, the night before. And then when I was hitting oh the God. atmosphere, it was nighttime in Iceland. Um, and I was shooting at the Glacier Lagoon. And it was just, it was my, you know, my first international solo photo trip. Uh. And night two, I'm getting the Northern Lights. I just, it, nothing could beat it. Oh, um, wow. It was just amazing. And then, and, you know, two hours later, I fell into the ice and um, got soaked. But oh, my God. Yeah, that was, that was probably not my smartest decision. Um, well, still that was told, probably your most memorable yeah, one. Yeah, <laughs> I still haven't told my mother about that. But, oh, my God. Um, I told my sister, and she just, she was like, well. Well, now your mother's going to listen to the show. <laughs> yeah, you course. know that. You're in big trouble, yeah. buddy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I pick him up at the airport on Monday, so I'm sure I'm going to get a smack side of the head. But, yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. Now, what I want to hear about that, though. So you were with somebody. No, I was alone. You were alone? <clears throat> yep. Oh, yeah, you are going to get hit. You're so, going to smack yeah, upside your head, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, I mean, I was trying to get the shot. I was framing things, and I, we had the icebergs floating in the lagoon. And, I and was it trying was to get, dark? It was dark. It was and night. you were all by yourself? Yeah, about midnight, midnight, In a strange country in the middle of nowhere mm -hmm. in freezing. Yep. Yeah. And uh, Don't do that again. I, I thought the ice was sturdy. I actually didn't even realize I was on the ice portion. I thought I was still on the oh. land portion. Oh, okay. So I kept on walking and I was I was getting the icebergs like just right, you know, as so you have and I wanted a little bit of a break. So I got the northern lights coming in reflecting in the like the calm water. Oh, and the next wow. day I know the water's not calm because my whole right leg is in. Um, my oh tripod my went God. over. I caught it. Um, so I, luckily I wasn't far from shore, but my I got almost my entire right side dunked in. Um, and I was able to sit down, um, kind of save myself, and then scurried off on, back onto land. But um, oh my god, it was a, it was a shock. Yeah, Let's put it that way. yeah. But your heart <laughs> was beating fast. Oh my god, sure was. Yeah. So you're never gonna do that again, right? Oh, I was, I was there like the next day. Yeah. You did the next day. Mm -hmm. I was just more careful the next time. Yeah. Don't you have somebody that you can travel with? I, I do. <laughs> I do have a travel buddy. Yeah, yeah. He uh, he doesn't like the cold. He's actually in Florida too. He's me. He's like yeah. me. <laughs> I everybody wants like, why don't you do trips to Iceland? I said because it's mm -hmm. cold there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I would be come to the Everglades. In fact, my favorite time in the Everglades is like August. Oh yeah. Because it's not that hot if you're slosh, sloshing mm -hmm. around in the water, you yeah. know. 
And the clouds are fabulous. Yeah, the clouds and, yeah. are amazing in yeah. the summer here. I don't like to be cold. <laughs> yeah, he, he came with me to um, Australia. We dove the Great Barrier Reef. Oh, wow. Um, and we did the, the Whit Sundays and the islands. We did a little boat trip. And uh, he loved that because it was warm. But Iceland, I offered, you know, I was like, hey, we got a workshop. We want to go a couple days early. You can see the Northern Lights and Ice Caves. She was like, eh, maybe another time. <laughs> <laughs> so, can't blame them, but. All right, so what are the locations that, like, people should put on their list that they need to see that you've been to? As much as I've talked about Iceland, I think that is one if you're into the outdoorsy stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're a photographer, you're, you're a landscape major photographer, even if it's just for a couple days. You can get a lot, Iceland's so small, out of Reykjavik, um, it's easy to get around. Um, so definitely Iceland, but then Tuscany. Um, and when you're, when you're in Tuscany, when you're shooting in Tuscany, uh, you know, you're shooting the vineyards and the olive groves and the old towns, and, but you know, when we're talking about landscape photography, typically it's, we're talking about sunrise, sunset. Yeah. Well, in Tuscany, between sunrise, sunset, you can drink wine and eat <laughs> cheese and crackers <laughs> and your meats and everything is homemade, fresh. Everyone's so nice. Dinner lasts for hours and you talk to the locals and they invite you into your home. Um, and just an otherworldly experience. Um, so, as you recently found out, for me, um, I mean, I studied in Florence. Okay. I'll, I'd go back in a heartbeat. Um, I I'd, I'd go back every year. I teach workshops out of Florence and Tuscany um, every year. Wow. And so for me, Italy is is a has to go. When's the best time to go? I I like May. May. May earliest June, um, but then once you start getting into mid June, you start hitting the really warm season, just like here in Florida. Um, it's hot. It's muggy. We're used to it, but you don't want to be you know kind of going Other around and yeah. yeah. And then it's tourist season, right? Yeah. So it's shoulder, shoulder season is, you know, mid-May to mid-June. Um, that's okay. a perfect time. Everyone's opening their stores, their vineyards. Um, they're excited to see tourists. It's just starting. Okay. Um, everyone's really nice. The weather's perfect. Um, and then, you know, it, it goes right into tourist season. So. I went in August and it was way hotter, mm -hmm. way hotter there than it is in Florida. Yeah. It was hot. I mean, I couldn't, and I'm pretty comfortable with the heat, yeah. but it was really hot. I was, it was over 100 degrees, I think three or four different days that we were there. Oh yeah, yeah. It and it never hot. gets over 100 yeah. in Florida. Like, I think, I've lived in Florida most of my life, maybe three, four times it's been over 100 yeah. degrees. It just doesn't get that hot here. <laughs> so what would be your five top tips for a successful photo trip? Um, the first thing is chase the light. Uh, okay. you, have to, you have to put yourself out there. Um, you know, if you're if you want to be a good photographer, if you want to be photographing, you, you have to be there. So um, you have to know. You should get that app or a similar app. I know we, uh, Joe yeah. uses Sun Surveyor, I think. But well, I just know so many of my friends. They're like, oh, you know, like you know, they don't they don't want to wake up and get out for a sunrise. Yeah. Well, you know, I know it's a sacrifice. It's waking up early when you're on vacation. But if you want to be a photographer, if you want to photograph, you, you have to put yourself in the yeah. situation to get the photograph. And there have been some really good photographs that if I had not just forced myself out of bed, I wouldn't have gotten. Um, number two, as much as I love shooting on manual, um, shoot on what you're comfortable with. Okay. If you're not comfortable taking a shot and you're more worried about your settings, you're going to miss the shot. Mm. Especially true if you're shooting nature, and I include wildlife in that, because it doesn't matter if you have the perfect settings if the lion's gone. Yeah. If the lion's there, and your ISO is 1800 yeah. or 3200 or whatever it is, well, at least you got the shot. You might not be able to blow it up huge, yeah. but you have it. You have, and you have it in as a memory at least. Yes, you do. Because to me, I am totally not opposed to just just taking pictures so you can remember the moment. Exactly. You know, they don't have to be pieces of art. Not yeah. everything you do. Yeah, right. So. I have tens of thousands of images. Not all of them were produced. Yeah. Um, number three, I love the tripod. Um, try a monopod if you're not a fan of the tripod. Um, you know, try. I, I love a platypod. It's called. You find them B and I just got one. Yeah, it's it's perfect. I haven't used it yet. They gave it to. You know, I spoke at the New yeah. England Camera Club conference, and they were there, and mm -hmm. they gave one to each of the speakers, which was a pretty nice gift. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. But I haven't been out to do because well, right from the conference, I was traveling, and yeah. I came home. It's been crazy. In cities, it's great. In cities, is because that the main time? Because you can put your time? tripod on it or tripod head on it. And it's not a tripod, so you can use it in Rome, you can use it in New York City, Empire State Building. And what it is, 
is it's like a little base. Yeah, it's a titanium plate. Plate, that's a yeah. good word. I can think two, of it. It has two screws in it, which are your tripod heads can screw onto. And so you're basically, it's like a tripod. Pretend that your tripod is missing and you just have the plate. And the plate can be balanced with the other four other screws that you screw into it. Really useful. Um, and you can put it on a wall or something like that mm -hmm. too for the cities because yep, you can't screw those. Yeah, there are holes in it so you can scrap things on. Um, yeah, strap it to a tree. Um, there are holes so you can actually put a screw into it, through it, into a tree. If you want to do a camera trap. So really, yeah, pretty useful. Yeah. Um, I've used it a lot. Okay. Um, bring it with me everywhere. Um, and it's small. You can carry it with you. Yeah, it fits in your light. bag. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's this big. So yeah. it's as big as your head, base, the tripod head, right? Yeah. The mm -hmm. tripod is, head is bigger than the actual platypod. And heavier, yeah. So yeah, that, it's so. very light. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, that's good advice. I think we're on three, so four. Okay. Um, get low and get high. Get low and get high. Yeah. Um, you know, there are, there are some really fun pictures when you get low onto the ground, when you lay down even. Um, one of my favorite shot, shots um, that one of my students took in Italy, um, the ruins of San Galgano. And she laid down, turned over, looked straight up, and shot it. And the church, this ruined abbey, had the roof gone. But because it was formed as an abbey, she actually photographed a cross. She was looking up at the sky. Oh. Really one of my favorite shots she has ever taken. Oh, wow. And she did it by getting low, turning up, and looking. So different angles. So she was laying on her back. Yep, she was laying wow. on her back, looking straight up, taking the camera. Okay. Yeah, handheld. Mm -hmm. When I first, okay, that was four. So we'll get back to five. <laughs> but when I first started my own company, I was a wedding photographer. And, you know, it, things are way more creative now than they were back then, yeah. you know? <laughs> but, um... I had an assistant and he would stand behind me and go, tilt, tilt, because I said, I have to remember to do different angles, you know, and do the tilt and things like that. He'd yep. go, tilt, tilt. <laughs> it was so cute. Anyway, go ahead, number five. So on, on the side of four as well, get low, get oh. high, it's twist. So the same thing you were oh, just saying. tilt, yeah, tilt. Yeah, it's tilt, tilt, yeah, let's Thank go. you, Cliff. <laughs> Every time you shoot a vertical, just, just turn, turn it horizontal and see what it looks like because you never know. It yeah. might be the right shot. Yeah. And the last thing um, that I am guilty of all the time, and I need to get better at, is, is don't be afraid to put yourself in the shot. So whether it's a time ah. release, um, most photographers are gonna be behind the camera. Yeah. You know, how many photographs are there that Ansel Adams took? How many of him? Yeah, what, what, is, what does he look like? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I always tell us, especially when we're on workshops, don't be afraid to put a timer on that and go and take a shot with a group or, or with your husband, with your wife, with your family and allow yourself to be in the photos. That's such a good point. This, there was a student of mine, she just went on a big trip and she made a book, mm -hmm. but you know, she did it digitally. So yeah. she sent it to everybody and she sent it to me and I said, you know, what's, what I like about this book is she's got, she and her husband and their friends mixed in, you know, so yeah. it, it looked more like she was there than just a book of landscapes, yeah, you know? Yeah, like they had a professional photographer following them around and photographing them. Well, I don't know if they were that professional, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it was just, yeah. it was more meaningful to look through it because it was like looking, oh, this is her trip and this is fun to see. But Absolutely. if it had just been a bunch of pictures, I can look at a bunch of pictures of Tuscany anywhere, right? Yeah. yeah. So this was her trip, which made it, you know, because she was yeah. in it. I like that advice. That's really good stuff. Now, I, I left a little extra time because I want to talk about your, because they're not in my questions, but I'm really interested in how you're selling your artwork too. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a whole lot, 15 minutes. 15 okay. minutes. How did you get into selling your artwork? So I, how it started out was I was trying to uh, envision my business strategy. This is when you were still a lawyer? This was after I'd quit. Okay. Yeah. So after I quit, um, I took uh, about eight weeks and I, I rented a car. Um, I, I flew to Vegas, rented a little Toyota Camry, put all my gear in the back, camping gear, photo gear, everything. And I, I did a tour of the Western states, essentially. Wow. Eight weeks, um, 9,000 miles. Uh, I think they had to retire that cruel after my <laughs> little trip. Um, so sorry, Enterprise. But it, basically, that's how I started. I knew I needed to build my portfolio, and that's the number one thing I knew. Um, I'm a huge fan of Peter Lick. Um, I, I love his captures, not as much maybe his colors. Mm -hmm. um, but I love his eye. I love what he was trying to do and how he, the, the, 
depths and the lengths he went okay. to get a shot. Okay. So I said, okay, if I can, if I can copy his work ethic, I can be successful. Okay. And you know, um, being you know in the in the modern age, I go, okay, well, what can I sell online? Yeah. What I found was that you, you can't really sell online, especially if you're trying to sell big images. Right. Um, so I got the advice, you know, print big. Mm -hmm. So I go, okay, if I print big, where do I show these? Can I get these into galleries? Can I? And I'm a, I was a no name. Um, you know, I wasn't in galleries. I wasn't anything. Um, had never been published. Right. So you now I started applying to contests. I won a few contests. Got a little bit of publishing over the course of months. Um, and then I said, you know what, like maybe art shows, art fairs. My family was like, you know, we always used to go to art shows and art fairs. And, you know, my folks are in Sarasota. So we used to go to the St. Armand's by Howard Allen all the time. It's like, you know what, I'll do that. But I was in North Carolina. So I'll do ones in Durham, Charlotte, up in D.C., Virginia, okay. um, Atlanta. So I would drive six hours for a weekend show in Atlanta. And basically I found I could sell well at those shows, but there weren't enough. So I moved to Florida. There weren't enough shows. Oh, because we do them, we have a longer yeah, season. Well, yep. That's why you moved to Florida. Uh -huh. oh. So my first show is tomorrow and the next day, Fort Lauderdale, the Las Olas. Oh, wow. Um, so those are my first shows for the season down here in Florida. I've done a, a few a couple weeks ago up north. So now I'm back in Florida. Show season is starting. So I have, um, you know, the Fort Lauderdale show. I have Delray right after Thanksgiving. Then I have Venice and St. Armand's in between. Okay. Uh, so those are the four I'm doing this fall, winter. Um, and then we kick back up and really January where we go full steam ahead with our shows. I think I have a show almost every weekend from January through March into April. Wow. And that's what I found is the best. I can connect with clients, customers. I can talk directly. Um, if people want to see a piece in their home, I can take it off my wall after the show bring it to their home, we can measure, we can do the right size and get it fit perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because I shoot such high res images and they're so big, I can do some cropping to make it fit perfectly. Um, then we can talk colors and do custom work as well. So, you know, I had a, I had a client uh, who wanted a um, specific one in Fort Lauderdale actually, um, in the 15th Street Fisheries. Okay. So I went out and I was able to take that for them. Ah. Her and her husband, I printed out nice and big for them and was able to get that on their walls. So, um, so yeah, it allows and me And you to met touch. them through an art fair? Yeah, met them through uh, the one in Fort Lauderdale. They, they now own three of my pieces. So oh, that's one awesome. One commission and, and two of mine own, so yeah. That's awesome. Well, you know, I, the, we teach a class called Selling Your Photography is Art, mm -hmm. and that's what we always say. If you, if you are serious, the fastest way is to do the art fairs. Yeah. Because people, when they see your work, yeah. it's not the same on the internet. It's just not the it same. It is not. It's really hard to get it on the in internet. It's hard to see the colors. It's hard to get the power. Um, you know, I'll, I'll have people walk into my booth at these shows. Wow. You know, there's, you know, they, they almost get like someone hit them with wind or something. They just get uh, kind of blown back. And that's, that's what I'm trying to get. That's the response I want. And if I'm not getting that, I'm doing something wrong. Okay. Um, and so I've been very lucky in that I, my eye is, is very good when it comes to what are people buying. Mm -hmm. um, I have, my eye is very similar. Now there are some pieces that I love and people shy nobody, away from. Nobody buys them. Yeah, and buy, it goes in my home. Um, but for the most That's part, That's what my home I'm is decorated good. with, <laughs> yep. the stuff that doesn't sell. But for, for the most part. It's like, part, oh, your stuff is so nice. Yeah. I'm like, you want to buy it? <laughs> I'm getting very lucky in that I have a, I have my oh. eye matches with a lot of my clients. That's so. awesome. Yeah. Now, do you have like a, what, is it mostly landscapes that you sell or? Mostly landscapes. Is it um, of like a certain like landscapes of Tuscany or is it goodness. just? So my, my three best sellers are Central Park in New York City. Okay. The Ice Cave in Iceland from four years ago um, where I fell into the water. Oh, geez. And then the town of Monterol and Cinque Terre, Italy. Wow. So yeah, just, just three, Yeah, not really not even related even, to each not other. Not at all, all different. Um, the one in, in Italy is just a coastal town. The one in Central Park is under the bridge with fall foliage, and the one in Iceland is just a blue ice cave. So not even the same color scheme, just, just I, y you could not have picked three more random images those out are... of my collection and been like, those are three of your top sellers, and they are. 
Now, do you put them in your on your website as, or on your booth as collections? Like you've got Iceland over here and Tuscany over here, or whatever. Yeah. So I have an Italy collection. I have an Iceland collection. I have a wildlife collection, okay. and I separate it based on scenery. So I have one that's like seascapes and piers. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah. Another one with just mountains. I have one that's rivers and lakes. So if people are looking for a river image, you know, click down there. So that's awesome. Yeah. And how long have you been doing this? Five years professionally. Wow, mm -hmm. that's a, you have a great story. Thank you. I think that's a very, very inspiring too, because I think so many people want to sell their artwork, but they, you know, I, I, they're a little lazy. I guess is the right word. I don't, I don't know what else to say. You know, it because does, yeah, it does take it's a, a lot bit. of work. It does, and it's an investment as well. Um, so if you're serious about it, you know, um, just from an art. Just from a perspective of getting a booth, um, you know, you're talking about application fee and paying for the booth, mm -hmm. your booth walls, your actual tent, and then all your artwork, and then how do you get your artwork there? So, how much does it cost to do the booth? Just to get the booth? Just and the to get walls? the booth, your, your the booth is around 500. Your walls are going to be around 2,500. Your tent's going to be around two grand. So you're you're looking at 5,000 right there, and then you have to get your art, and you have to transport your art. So if you have a big SUV already then you might be able to squeeze that out. Otherwise, you have to buy a trailer, another couple thousand yeah. dollars. Then you have to produce your artwork and get it done correctly. And you have to have not only your artwork, but also backup spares. Um, you know, you're, just, just for me to even bring out you know, six or eight new pieces cost me a couple thousand dollars. Right. So when you're trying to refit out a whole new booth, you're talking about eight to 10,000. If you're if you're high quality acrylic pieces, really nicely matted frames, um, done correctly, uh, if you want to throw in lighting, that's another few hundred dollars. So it all yeah. adds up. So how much do you think if you want to do it right? How much do you think it costs you for your first time? If, if you were to go and just write a check and say I'm going to do it right, I'm going to pay for all this up front, you're probably spending around fifteen thousand dollars. And what if you want to do it budget? What could if you, you want get a buy on? Budget. Including your artwork. Yeah, so if you want a budget, the one thing you can't skimp on is your artwork. Right. So you're okay. going to spend five to seven on your artwork. Then everything else you can rent, you can borrow, beg, um, <laughs> no stealing, but um, you, know, you could probably get that for a couple thousand. So on the low end, you know, to, to do an art show, um, if you, if you, uh, you know, decrease your budget for your artwork a little bit, you can maybe do an art show for about 5,000. Okay. And you said quality frames are important, mm -hmm. which I really agree because art and collectors know the difference between a cheap frame yeah. and a nicely and made you frame. you got to protect your frames. And you can buy inexpensive frames that are nicely made, mm -hmm. but you have to usually buy them in bulk. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Do you now you frame your stuff? You said, I don't or? frame myself. You don't no. frame. No. Do you do acrylic or canvas? I do acrylic. Um, I still do canvas. I don't sell as many canvas anymore. Um, people love the acrylic look. Okay. They love the metal look as well. Okay. Um, so those are my two best sellers. And uh, uh, and who do you use for your metal work? I know we had somebody on the show who recommended um, a company because I've had problems with the metal ones chipping. Yeah. So so what you actually have to do is you actually have to sand the corners of them. Um, around the edges. It's really weird, um, but it's how, it's how they best do it, from, stop them from chipping. Um, there's a lab in Jupiter, Florida. That uh, might called, be the one he was talking called, about. Called Shiny Prints, and they are... I think that is the one he was talking about. Of all of the metal printing labs in the country, they're one of two labs that has the new Epson printer that's okay. built, designed, and inked for metals. The only other lab is Bay Photo out in California. And they're the big boy. Yeah, Bay they're, Photo. You know, they're the big one on the right. block. Um, the shiny prints in Florida, better pricing, same if not better quality than Bay, and they're local. They're wow. you know, and, and the owners, you, you know, yeah. the owners are fantastic. They'll work with you, um, and they start doing a little bit of framing as well. Um, so if you're into the metal, but you don't like the non-framed metal, they also do framing now. Oh, okay. Yeah, they just started it. I don't even think I might have. I might have jumped the gun there and, and just maybe they're get not out even secret. offering it <laughs> yet yeah, on the website. It's coming soon if it's not there already. Um, but yeah, they're they're fantastic. Oh yeah. yeah well, you're the quality. second guest who who brought them up. Yep. So yeah. So as soon as you said Jupiter, I said I think that was where he mm -hmm. was, because I think he was based in Jupiter. I can fix. I can see his face. I, his name is gone. Craig. Craig. 
Dietrich, right? Dietrich. Diet Rick. Yeah. Diet Rich. That's how you yeah. remember how to spell his yeah. name. <laughs> yeah. You talk to Craig, you talk to any of these other guys down uh. here and gals, photographers here in Florida, if we're doing metal prints, almost they've captured almost everyone's business oh, okay. because of their quality. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you do the, you also do acrylic. Mm -hmm. Acrylics I do through Bay. Bay through Photo. Bay Photo. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They did. A, they came out with a non-glare acrylic glass, oh. which is fantastic. I just put a picture, um, an image, a thirty by sixty. Uh, of San Gimignano in Italy at sunset with the olive groves and the small town into uh, my client's house in, um, in Lakewood Ranch actually. Okay. And we did it with, because he has a wall of windows, just huge windows overlooking the pool and uh, put the non-glare up and you can, there's no glare. Barely, if anything, only looking from at one angle. Oh, and then we put lighting above it. It's, it's fantastic, it's beautiful. Now do you, do you hang your own work? You, I will. Mm -hmm. You will, but sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. I will if people want me to. Okay. Yeah. So because I'm I'm doing some some of the same shows all the time, and uh, it takes me a little while to get you know prints done. Um, you know, I'll have clients you know in, in Jupiter, or Juno, and I'll do a show there, and maybe I'll be back in a month later. Hey, if you can wait a month, I'll pick up the piece from the lab, or I'll get it shipped out to you, and then I'll come and I'll hang it for you. And I've I've ha I've had that be the close on some of my sales. Okay. So like, I, I want this huge piece, but I don't want to hang it. I don't want to yeah, worry about it. Yeah, how do I hang I that wanna, up? You know? I, and then you hire a handyman and yeah. he puts a hole in your wall. Yeah, exactly, so I know how to do it. How do what, you do it? So what I do is I do a lot of cleat mount uh, okay. hanging. So it's just the, the metal cleat. Uh -huh. um, get that on, we come, I, uh, I you know bring my little um, a level on it, put it on it, cleat it, mark the holes, drill into to screw holes put it on and you can move it side to side to make sure it's centered. It takes me maybe all of 10 minutes to do. Wow. As long as you know how to do it right. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. That's good to know too. Yeah. Not that I'm going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to add? Because we're, 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 we're closing about done, huh? down. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank I'm you glad for it coming. Out. Yeah, yeah. That was a fascinating show. I'm just, it's thank so you. very inspiring. It's thank nice you. to yeah. hear people succeeding in the business, you know? It is, yeah. And for, for us, um, I'm saying for photographers, for also for, for young photographers um, here in Florida, um, you know, it's, it's so important that, that you go out and shoot and not just get caught up into the Instagram stuff. Like, try to, try to make artwork. Um, not yeah. just you know, not just the, your day-to-day -day stuff because um, photography is an art, and if we don't keep at it, we'll, it won't be. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the nice things. I mean, it's it's a it's a blessing and it's a curse, right? That it's there are just so many photographers. Yeah, and so it's harder to make a living as mm -hmm. a photographer because oh, of that. Sure. But on the other hand, the, st the 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 artwork that you see coming out now is it's mind blowing to yeah. me. In fact, now, you know, and, and I still do weddings. I'm still a wedding photographer, but not, not very many. I do maybe four or five a year. I have some younger people who work with me yeah. who do the weddings in my company. But the stuff they put out sometimes, I feel like, wow, I'm, I'm like behind in the times. It's so hard to, you know, but they do a lot of the Photoshop things. Oh, and yeah. They do some amazing things. It's just, that's what all the comp competition has done, is yeah. helped re people really push the envelope to come up with the really cool it shots is, yeah. and things that's like great. that. So, well, thank you. Yeah, thanks. And thank you for watching or listening. If you're listening to us on the podcast, remember you can listen to the Understand Photography Show on iTunes or however you listen to podcasts. Join us next week for episode 111 with creative nature photographer Brian Call. Brian has been on the show before. He was such a good guest. We're bringing him back. I'm Peggy Farron. Thank you for watching the Understand Photography Show.